everybody and welcome back to room nine, our region's largest classroom. My name is Miss St. Louis and I'm a teacher at Rogers Elementary School in the Melville School District. And we are located in South St. Louis County. Today, I'm here to teach a reading lesson that's geared towards students who are in the third grade, but all learners are more than welcome to explore and learn along with us. So let's get started. This week, we have been talking about all things nonfiction texts. Now remember, Nonfiction texts are written to give us information, right? Their purpose is to provide us with some information so that we can continue to learn more, whether that be about people, places, or things. So when we talk about nonfiction texts, some nonfiction texts are written with more of the perspective of trying to persuade us to think a certain way or to take a certain viewpoint. And today we're gonna to be talking all about point of view. Now we've talked about point of view in the past. And we've talked about how books can be written in first person, second person, or third person, right? And we're talking about the language that an author uses. Today, when we talk about point of view, we're gonna talk about how the point of view is the way a person or character views an object or situation, right? Their perspective on something. So, I like to think about newspaper articles. We recently had an election. Have you guys seen any newspaper articles that relate to the election that we had? Yeah, so there's an author who writes those newspaper articles and some authors are for certain candidates and some authors are for different candidates. And so based on their beliefs, right, their opinions, right, which we talked about yesterday, it can come out in their writing and they might be writing to persuade you to vote for a certain person or to think a certain way or to believe in a certain something. So that can come out and be their point of view, right? It's the way they're viewing that situation. Okay. And so today we're going to kind of explore that a little bit into how an author can put their point of view into a text. So when we're talking about point of view, there are some questions that we can ask ourselves. And the first is, well, what is the author's opinion? So let me grab my notes from yesterday. Opinion is a, person, is a person's personal view or judgment on a topic. So we all have opinions on lots of things, right? We might have our own personal favorite color or favorite book, favorite movie, but we also feel certain ways about things. In regards to the election, people really like certain candidates over others, or people really want certain actions to be taken. So they have their own opinions. Now, opinions are always valid and everybody's entitled to their own opinion. And that can come across in your point of view. So we wanna think about, well, what is this author's opinion? Is it good, is it bad? Are they for or against something? Do they want me to do something or not do something? What are they feeling? We also want to think about what message is the author trying to send? Is the author trying to get me to vote a certain way? Or is the author trying to get me to stop something, right? So a lot of the times we've seen articles lately that deal with our environment, right? People want us to start making sure that we're taking care of our environment. So are they trying to get me to maybe stop using so much water, right? And another thing we want to pay attention to is what words does the author use to show their feelings? Words are so powerful. And when authors choose words, they choose them for a reason. And they can help to show a point of view in a certain way. And we'll explore words a little bit later today. But to start, I want to share with you some different opinions that people have. And I want you to tell me in these points of view, okay? What's the author's opinion? What message are they trying to send? Are you ready? Here's my first one. Children should not be allowed to have social media until they are 16. Hmm. Let me read that again while you think. Children should not be allowed to have social media until they are 16. Now, this is someone's point of view. So, hmm. What's their opinion? Well, the topic is social media, right? 
And this person's opinion is that children shouldn't have it until they're 16 years old. So what message do you think they might be trying to send? What do you, what, why do you think they might feel this way, might have this point of view? Maybe they're thinking of safety. Absolutely, that might be something that they're thinking about. Responsibility, sure, they might be thinking about making sure that we're able to take care of it. Yeah, maybe they just don't, right? Most people don't have access to technology until they're 16. So there's a lot of different things, right? And so if this was an article, we might be able to continue to read on to see a little bit more about why this author has this certain perspective, okay? So when you're writing things like opinion papers, it's always important that you give reasons for your opinion. So right now we're just exploring some opinions. And the next step is to start looking at those reasons. Why does someone feel that way? Let's look at another one. Recycling is pointless and we should stop doing it. Recycling is pointless and we should stop doing it. What is this opinion all about? Yeah, it's about recycling. And how does the author feel about recycling? Yeah, they feel like it's like a waste of time, right? Why are we doing this? So as we would continue to read the article, we might figure out why the author might feel this way and where this opinion came from. Very good, let's look at another one. Students should have to wear a uniform to school. Students should have to wear a uniform to school. Hmm. Well, there are some students who wear uniforms to school and you might even be one of those kids who wears a uniform to school. So what message do you think the author is trying to send here? Maybe that everyone should look the same when they go to school. Yeah, that might be what they're trying to say. What else? Ooh, maybe that it might make it easier, right, to get ready in the morning. Hmm. We definitely might need to read a little bit further into this one. But let me ask, what's your opinion? Would you like to wear a uniform to school or would you like to choose your own clothes? Or if you're someone who wears a uniform to school, do you like wearing a uniform to school? Or would you like to choose your own outfit? Hmm. Something to think about. Let's look at one more. Children should receive an allowance for chores. Children should receive an allowance for chores. So, hmm. What do we think about this? What's the, what message is the author trying to put across? Yeah, you should get money for the things that you do around the house. Now, hmm, raise your hand. Who gets a, who, which of you gets an allowance for your chores? Hmm. Yeah, now we might have to read into this article a little bit further, but some things that we might have to think about are what chores, right? And how much money for certain chores? Because kids out there do different things, right? If you're 10 years old, you might be able to do more chores than maybe a brother or sister who's five years old. So we have to think about that. Hmm. It would be very interesting to see what some of you have to write about some of these topics. I hope they got your brain thinking a little bit. Now, one of the other things that we touched on before when we're thinking about someone's point of view, we have to think about the words that they use, okay? And the words they use show their feeling. And so those might be words like dangerous, fun, exciting, terrible, favorite, horrible, right? We choose our words to get our perspective across, to show our opinion. If I liked watermelon, and I really wanted to show it, I would be telling you that watermelon is my favorite fruit ever. It's the best. It's 
so amazing. That makes you really want to try watermelon if you've never had it. But if I just came up here and said, watermelon's okay. Are you really that excited to try watermelon? Probably not because I didn't sell it to you with my words. If I really wanted to get you to do something, right? And uh, let's say we're talking about recycling and I'm writing from the opposite point of view and I really want you to recycle. I might use words like it's super important, right? And it'll help you save the earth. The choice of words I'm making is what's really going to make people choose to do something or choose to believe a certain way. So the, we want to pay attention to the words that our author is using and maybe why they're using them. What are they trying to get us to think or believe, right? What is their point of view on the subject? All right, so let's talk about our book for the day. The book that we are going to read today is called Pipsqueaks, Slowpokes, and Stingers. Celebrating Animal Underdogs by Melissa Stewart, illustrated by Stephanie Labris. And the back says, punny, smelly, clumsy, shy. Take a look at the surprising traits that help some animals survive. So what we are going to try and do today is figure out the point of view that the author has about these animal underdogs, right? We're trying to figure out about how does she view the object, in this case, the animal underdogs. So before we get started, what is an underdog? Right, it's somebody who can come out on top, even though maybe we wouldn't suspect that they would. Sometimes we hear the term underdog when it relates to sports. And we might hear it about a team that had a really bad start to the season, right? Maybe they had some injuries or they traded players and their team just wasn't winning any games and was having a really hard time. But despite all of that, they came out on top and maybe they ended up winning the championship, right? So they're considered the underdog, someone who started off at a low point and was able to survive or win right? Despite maybe some things working against them. So these are some animal underdogs. Hmm. Do you recognize some of those animals on the cover? I recognize a few of them. Let's see what we have to say about them. Everyone loves elephants. They're so big and strong. Everyone respects cheetahs. They're so fast and fierce. But this book isn't about the animals that we admire. Whoa, admire. What does that mean if we admire something? Right, we look highly upon it, right? We enjoy it, we love it, we give it lots and lots of like faith is put into those, very good. It's about the unsung underdogs of the animal world. Don't you think it's time somebody paid attention to that? Oops, my pages are sticking. Let's start with this little critter, the Estrusian pygmy sh shrew. Well, that's tough to say. Estruscan pygmy shrew. I hope I'm saying it right. It's a real pipsqueak. Look, its name is longer than its body. An emu frog is even smaller. It could perch on your pinky with room to spare. Whoa, that's small. Look at your pinky. Look how little the size is of that. I've never seen a frog that small. How can these puny peewees survive in a world full of predators with huge teeth and razor sharp claws? Hmm. They're so small. You wouldn't even see them, right? You might accidentally step on them and not even ever know they were there. Let's see. Believe it or not, size is on their side. When hulking hunters get too close, 
our little heroes slip into small secret spots their enemies can't reach. Look, the frog's hiding right in there. You can barely see him. It takes a Galapagos tortoise almost six hours to travel a mile. What a slow poke. Most people can walk that far in just 20 minutes. And so why don't these creeping critters get a move on? Well, because tortoises don't need speed. Their hard, strong shells protect them from predators. Maybe that's a hawk or a falcon, but that shell is protecting them. I don't know, what do you think? Do you think you could beat a tortoise in a race? Probably. Pete, you. What's that stinking stench? Me, the hoaxin. This strange bird eats lots of leaves, and as it digests them, its body reeks worse than cow manure. Ew. Feeling sick to your stomach? Then you might not want to know about Zorillas. Their nasty spray is stronger than a skunk's and the awful odor lasts longer. Should Hotsons and Zorillas clean up their act? Yuck. Nobody would want to get near them, right? If they smelled gross. Hmm. But I guess that's what helps them to survive, right? No way! These stinkers are sending their enemies a powerful message. When hungry hunters sniff a whiff of a Hoaxin's body odor, they lose their appetites. And when predators smell a Zorilla's stinky spray, they skedaddle. Look at that. These little guys have such a great way to protect themselves. Ever seen an okapi? Oh, okapi? I think it's okapi. If not, you aren't alone. It's one of the shyest animals on earth. You know, I just saw one of these guys on the TV the other day. We were at the zoo. So why does the horse-sized creature choose to live alone in shadowy forests? Well, so it can stay safe. When an okapi senses danger, silently sneaks out of sight. Can you see him in the picture? He almost looks like he's camouflaged, doesn't he? Koalas and giant armadillos snooze for 18 hours a day. Boy, are they lazy. Little brown bats get even more shut eye. The rest for twenty they rest for twenty hours a day. Should these sleepy slackers change their ways? Whew, that's almost their entire day. If they sleep for twenty hours a day, that's only four hours they have awake. It's not a lot of time. Nope. Napping is the secret to their survival success. Because koalas Giant armadillos and little brown bats since spend so much time resting, they don't need to get as much energy from their food as more active animals. Oh, so look, this is the bat just eats a little bug. We've got some leaves for the koala and our armadillo has some worms. Oh, look at all those fish that that penguin has to eat and all that meat for the cheetah. Hmm. I wonder where we might fit in on this scale. Hmm. What's the world's clumsiest critter? Probably the western fence lizard. As it skitters along tree branches, it sometimes loses its balance and falls to the forest floor. Fun. Why does the little lizard run so fast that it stumbles over its feet? because it needs speed to catch quick crawling critters and insects. Would you rather take a tumble once in a while than starve to death? Oh, 
wouldn't you rather take a tumble once in a while than starve to death? Hmm. That's a good question to ask. Which would you rather do? Probably take a little tumble, right? In winter, a walrus's thick layer of fat can weigh more than 400 pounds. Seals and sea lions fatten up too. What a bunch of blubbery blobs. Think these plump lumps should go on a diet? That's a lot of weight. Hmm. Hmm, what do you think? Let's see. Think again. Blubber helps walruses, seals, and sea lions stay warm in chilly ocean water. Remember, blubber's that layer of fat. It also provides energy during periods when the animals can't hunt for food. Hmm. Like they brought their own snacks along a little bit. Now, feast your eyes on these curious critters. Or maybe you'd rather not. After all, naked mole rats are her real eyesore. They use their giant buck teeth to dig for tasty roots, and their furless bodies help them beat the heat in their hot desert homes. Should naked mole rats rush out to see an orthodontist and buy a cozy coat? You decide. It's easy to admire animals that are big and fast, lean and graceful. You might even be tempted to make fun of creatures that seem slow, lazy, or shy. But consider this. What seems like a weakness could actually be a strength. Every animal on earth, from tiny shrews and stinky zorillas to shy okapis and clumsy lizards, has its own special way of surviving. The end. And so the end of this book gives us a little more information about some cool things about them. For example, the Galapagos tortoise can live up to be 150 years old, right? Or Thanks to the walrus, th thanks to its thick blubber, a walrus can survive as, in temperatures as low as negative 31 degrees Fahrenheit. Right, so there's some cool facts about these guys. So that is our book, Pip Squeaks, Slow Pokes, and Stinkers. So our author, Melissa Stewart, wrote this book for a reason, right? To show her point of view about these animal underdogs. So what is her point of view? What is she trying to get across to us? Yeah, that animals are important. That all animals are important. Yeah, that they're all special and unique. Yeah, that's a good one. Oh, I like that. We shouldn't judge a book by its cover. Have you ever heard that saying before? Don't judge a book by its cover. So what that saying means is that just based on the first looks of somebody, right? Based on how they look or how they smell, right? We shouldn't make judgments on them because we haven't really seen what's inside. So even though we've got some animals that are really, really small or some animals that smell or maybe some animals that have a lot of fat on them, it doesn't make them worthless. It's something that can work for them to help them survive, right? So these guys all do these things for a reason, right? And they've been able to survive for a really long time. Look at this Galapagos tortoise. He can live to be up to 150 years old, even though he moves so slowly. So 
just because these guys are considered underdogs doesn't mean that they were worthless and that we should make fun of them because some of the things we make fun of are actually some of the things that make them really cool and unique and help them to survive. So that's what I think that our author was trying to get across. So boys and girls, today we talked a little bit more about some nonfiction books and we talked about point of view. Point of view is the way a person or character the views an object or situation, right? It's their perspective on something. And so we can identify a person's point of view by asking ourselves, what's the author's opinion on the topic? What message is the author trying to send across? And what words does the author use to show their feelings, right? A lot can come from words. So the thing I want you to remember from today is that point of view isn't just in books. Point of view is all around us, right? Look at commercials you see on TV or um, signs that you see, right? There's a point of view in all of these signs as you go past and it's kind of fun to go around our world and see what are people's point of view? What are they trying to get me to see, right? What message are they trying to send to me? And sometimes that message is good and sometimes that message isn't always so good. It's important that we pay attention to the things that are coming are from around us and so that we know what's going on, right? So point of view is everywhere. It's always something that we should be paying attention to, especially when it comes to some books because they might show us a new point of view that we've never thought of before and give us a new perspective on something. So boys and girls, I hope that you learned something new today and that you'll take a new look at the world around you. And until I see you again, I hope that you have a great rest of your day. Bye everybody. made possible with support of Bank of America, Dana Brown Charitable Trust, Emerson, and viewers like you.